Um, all right. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dustin O'Hara. Uh, I'm the director of the Internet Studies Center at Western Washington University. Um, as a quick note, uh, I, I want to say that this lecture is being recorded and we have plans to publish them online. So please keep that in mind. Um, the, um, the Internet Study Center aims to foster uh, an interdisciplinary approach to the study and design of digital technology. And the lecture series uh, presents leading scholars and practitioners whose work challenges and extends our understanding of digital technology and its place in the world. Um, a bit about our speaker today, uh, Gabriel Mugar is a senior design researcher at the global design consultancy IDEO and the founder of the uh, Transformative Culture Project, a Boston-based youth arts organization. Um, he specializes in working with communities and organizations to design opportunities for learning, collaboration, and storytelling. Um, and uh, with that, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Gabriel. Uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Dustin. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to be part of this series. Love the topic. Um, such, such an important theme to be exploring right now. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you to the Internet Studies Center uh, for uh, including us, uh, and by us, I mean myself and my co-author, Eric, who's uh, not with us tonight, but um, you know, we're really grateful to be able to share this work with all of you uh, with, this, with this theme in particular. So as Dustin said, my name is uh, Gabriel Mugar. I'm a senior design researcher at IDEO. Um, I am based out of the Cambridge studio in Massachusetts. And prior to my work in industry, I worked as an applied academic researcher at the Emerson College Engagement Lab. Uh, and before that, I received my PhD in information science and technology at Syracuse University. So um, I am in industry, but I definitely have an academic background. Um, and so I wrote this book with Eric Gordon, who's a visiting professor at MIT and director of the Engagement Lab at Emerson College. And we wrote this book about how to build trust in public serving organizations and the role that technology plays in both the problem and the solution. And this book was published uh, in February of this year, and the world has certainly changed quite a bit. Uh, and so today I'm gonna share with you some of the top level concepts from this book uh, and suggest some of the ways that it might provide insight into how we can respond and, em and emerge from this global crisis. So first I want to start with a story from Singapore. So in Singapore, there's this app called Trace Together, and it tells you that you've been uh, within two meters of someone who has tested positive for COVID-19 for a prolonged period of time. And say upon hearing that news, uh, either through notification from the app or from a human contact tracer, you voluntarily self-isolate. And the, oops, sorry. And in addition to this app, say there's also this robot named Spot, uh, which is walking through this public park and it's sensing the crowds through Bluetooth proximity sensors. And it, the, the bot is kindly reminding you to stay at least two meters apart uh, from each other. So why might something like this work? Well, the primary reason is really rooted in this underlying trust between the potential users and the institutions that this technology represents. So for example, you know, I believe in climate change because I trust in science, I trust in the organizations like universities that represent it. I certainly haven't read all the scientific papers myself, but I definitely trust the institutions to take, to take that leap in believing what they've published. Um, and that's in part because I have been well served by these institutions for the most part, right? Um, but what if I haven't been? What if I have been excluded by some of these institutions? What if, I've been, what if I have been wronged by some of these institutions? Without the trust in these institutions, the only thing that's left really is some form of coercion, right? Technological mediation is not going to remove the need for, for trust. Um, the other thing that's really key for any of these measures to work is that there needs to be a belief in the value of public health. This is a, a cultural issue that needs to be considered when designing and introducing technology, especially in the case of COVID. 
<clears throat> so why is there a challenge right now with contact tracing and just general response to um, measures of, of preventing the spread of, of COVID? So in an article in the New England Journal of Medicine, Blendon et al. describe how the confidence in medical leaders has gone from 75% in 1966 to 34% in 2014. And that we tend to trust our own doctors, but not the healthcare system as a whole. And this distrust in a system indeed plays a large part in some of the challenges that we're facing today. So as Dhruv Kular notes, <clears throat> Perhaps most concerning is the evidence that uh, low levels of trust can weaken the ability of uh, governments and public agencies to respond to epi epidemics. And we see this distrust in marginalized communities across the country. So from rural communities left behind by changes to the economy, to urban communities of color demanding that we end police violence and structural racism. Distrust in civic institutions is warranted. Um, we might look at this trust fault line as existing along a binary of those that have benefited from public serving institutions and those that have not. And so one proxy for this fault line is seen in the data from the Pandemic Response Network at Duke University, which shows that the adoption of technology for contact tracing is high among low risk populations and low among high risk populations. So again, the low risk populations being those that have been well served by institutions where there's a tremendous amount of privilege and low uh, high risk populations being those populations that have not been well served by institutions. So if trust in public institutions is such a big part of how we find a path out of this pandemic, uh, where then does the responsibility lie for rebuilding this trust? So to start <clears throat> in our book, Eric and I argue that rebuilding that trust doesn't come from implementing technology that creates a more efficient and tightly connected relationship between people and government. Uh, take, for example, the recently shuttered uh, sidewalk labs. Uh, this is a smart city project or was a smart city project in Toronto. And as Shannon Matern wrote in her recent article in Places Journal, this project failed to get traction after, after it did not take seriously the relational work that was required around building alliances and gaining trust of the community to see value in what was essentially a new surveillance apparatus. Coming back to the example of contact tracing, uh, Bordeaux, Gray, and um, Gross in an article in The Hill in April wrote that contact tracing programs require that people trust the entity to whom they are reporting. Trust is built on empathy, patience, <clears throat> and the ability to help someone who has just been exposed to a life-threatening disease. Contact tracing hinges on the deeply human exchanges. There is no app for that. So what does it look like to build trust between public serving institutions and people while also involving technology as a key mediator in that relationship? So the story of the Citizen Police Data Project in Chicago provides some insight into what this looks like. And this is a case from the book. <clears throat> so uh, CPDP is a database that provides visibility to complaints filed against police. And this is a project started by investigative reporter Jamie Calvin, who was reporting from the Stateway Gardens uh, housing project in Chicago and witnessed a number of police abuse abuses that went undisciplined. And he worked with a network of lawyers and activists to use FOIA requests as a means to release and make public data about uh, make public data about these about these complaints. And of course, putting this information online was not received well by the Chicago Police Department. However, Calvin uh, was building a network with people within the police department who saw these abuses and wanted to see the behavior change. And so the real adoption um, came not long after the data from the project helped win a landmark case on police abuses in Chicago. 
uh, with the city setting up a police accountability task force and various civic institutions publicly aligning themselves with the project to indicate their commitment to being trustworthy. So reading the quote here, Jamie Calvin's tireless work in building networks, sharing outcomes, <clears throat> continually listening and transforming the technology demonstrates the texture of civic innovation. And I share this story as uh, a counterexample to challenges facing contact tracing and the shortfall of projects like Sidewalk Labs. Uh, in this example, I really want to highlight that the innovation of the database did not begin and end with its creation. That it was instead a matter of building alliances and creating opportunities for conversation across concerned publics. <clears throat> and it's stories like Jamie's that really define so much of what this book is about. Uh, it's about how people are doing the work of building trust and evolving public serving institutions. So how are people building trust and evolving institutions? So Jamie Calvin really fits this archetype of people that are shaping civic life by prioritizing trust building. Jamie is what Eric Gordon and I describe in our book as a civic designer. Uh, and I want to read a passage from the book now. So uh, this book is about those practices that challenge the normative applications of smart technologies in order to build or repair trust with publics. It is about design, but not necessarily about designers. It's about those people working within public serving organizations that are attempting to reshape programs, mission and purpose by creating the conditions through which organizations form relationships and build trust with publics. They are already employed by organizations all over the world, but in most cases, the organizations don't know it yet. They masquerade as technologists, communication specialists, journalists, producers, and engagement officers, but they are doing the work of designers and they are thoughtfully and often quietly innovating the shape of civic life. And it's this output of civic design, civic innovation, that is really the organizing principle of this book. So Eric and I uh, describe successful cases of civic innovation, <clears throat> uh, highlighting that change doesn't just happen through disruption, um, rattling the cages of institution from the outside and being unattractive to a competitor. Innovation in a civic context is a product of creating conversations across stakeholders where intentions are laid bare, interests are made mutual, and from which a new approach might emerge. So, reading the quote here, innovation is not simply inventing to disrupt an existing practice, model of practice, but <clears throat> in supporting groups of people to cultivate new mo models of practice. And the definition of civic innovation comes from research that started in 2015 and went on through 2018. So there, there's really three kind of big sources of information that, uh, sources of, of data that, that um, really kind of situate and, and help to define uh, what this book is about. So the first <clears throat> is a national study that I helped to lead while I was at the Engagement Lab, uh, which was a series of conversations with civic practitioners using media and technology um, in Boston, Chicago, and Oakland. Uh, and this is uh, research that took place between 2017 and 2018 and was funded by the MacArthur Foundation. Uh, the next uh, source of data was um, what a series of workshops and, and practices that came after we published this report with the MacArthur Foundation that looked at the practice of civic designers, uh, where we developed a framework that I'll, I'll talk about and that framework and those sets of practices help to inform the work of engagement journalists around the world um, in their mission of rebuilding trust with their communities. And so we had we were really fortunate to just be able to see the output of the book of, of the initial report that is part of this book, um, you know, drive practice and then see how that was having impact. And then uh, it's also this book also draws on case studies um, from work that Eric has led at the Engagement Lab uh, since 2015 using um, modes of play as uh, opportunities for civic engagement. And so through this research, uh, we really saw this distinction emerge between uh, what civic innovation, uh, what made civic innovation successful versus what made 
market innovation successful. And as I'll talk about how the logics that drive market innovation are not compatible with innovation in a civic context, right? The value systems, the things that are prioritized when we're, when we're innovating for the private sector don't really carry over uh, when we're innovating for the public sector. So to give you this high level overview of the differences, instead of markets, civic innovation is concerned with publics. Instead of consumption, we look to play. Instead of disruption, we look to care. And instead of transaction, we look to relation. And much of civic innovation is connected by a common logic, meaningful inefficiencies. And meaningful inefficiencies uh, are any process where an inefficiency is deprioritized in favor of relation, connection, or reflective practice. Uh, it describes the productive lag in systems generated by rules that enforce and justify playing. And so this idea of meaningful inefficiencies uh, is really inspired by uh, Bernard Suit's description of games. So reading this quote, to play a game is to attempt to achieve a specific state of affairs using only means permitted by the rules, where the rules prohibit use of more efficient uh, in favor of less efficient means, and where the rules are accepted just because they make possible such activity. So if we were to take um, the game of golf as an example, the efficient approach to achieving the goal of golf would be to just walk right up to the hole and drop the ball in. Um, but instead, the game emerges through the sand traps, the rolling terrain, the various clubs, all of these elements combined along with the rules create a new relationship with the terrain, with the objective, with the people that we're playing with. It's wildly inefficient but it creates a new relationship with our surroundings. And so in our research across the United States and <clears throat> looking at the work of the engagement journalists and, and, and the work that Eric has been doing uh, at the engagement lab, um, we saw meaningful inefficiency, meaningful inefficiency is showing up in four distinct activities that shape the work of civic design. And that's network building, holding space, distributing ownership, and persistent input. And so I'm gonna go over each of these um, in detail. So <clears throat> the first activity that we identified in our research is network building. And civic designers really place a premium on convening people as part of their practice. They often place value on informal gathering, uh, spaces that bypass some of the strictures of, of formal meetings or input sessions. For the anti-eviction mapping pro uh, project in Oakland, success um, for Aaron McElroy, the founder of, of the project, uh, was described as, as being part of a broader network of people in the problem space of eviction. Uh, I'm reading this quote, whether it's a housing clinic or a legal organization, it's nice to know that I can email or call or show up to somebody's office and people know who I am and who the mapping project is or one of the many groups doing a lot of these things. <clears throat> and what's important to emphasize here is that what Aaron uh, told us in our interviews with them is that for a lot of activists in the Bay Area, a lot of the public spaces that are, are used, uh, the convening spaces, the buildings that, that have been historically used as, as places for, for activists to come together, are rapidly disappearing, right? Um, property values are increasing, everything's just being turned into high-priced condos. And so those places where activists can come together are starting to disappear. So really this is where why the premium of, of network building is so high and why it's seen as, as one of the key practices and successes of projects. The next practice is holding space. So the work of striving for common good in civic design really involves defining a shared set of values and anticipated benefits. And so our research revealed that the work of defining the characteristics of common good of, of mutual benefit is supported by holding space for discussion. So we observe this through descriptions of, uh, from practitioners about um, 
holding regular meetings and workshops where the interests and needs of various stakeholders were articulated and then helped to shape subsequent steps in the design process. And so for City Bureau, uh, a community journalism organization working in Chicago's South Side, uh, holding space to define common good is accomplished by hosting the public newsroom, which is this weekly gathering at their offices where journalists and members of the public discuss local issues, share information about emerging stories, and support residents in conducting their own reporting efforts. And so holding space for discussions in the neighborhood where they work allows City Bureau to be responsive to the issues of the community by supporting work to, direct, to directly address those issues. And reading this uh, quote here from uh, one of the staff at City Bureau, who said that, what does it uh, mean to also empower folks to have ownership and contribute to information systems? We talk a lot about changing systems of journalism so that we hear folks. Journalism shouldn't be giving voices to the voiceless. It should be thinking about what are the methods in which we are collecting voices and how are some of those methods deaf or just not listening uh, well. And so again, this, this role of having these regular convenings where people drive the conversation is one of those new methods for um, bringing those voices together. The third practice is distributing ownership. So distributing ownership describes the work of positioning <clears throat> the constituents of a problem space to take it over and further define the characteristics of that project. So in our study, the work of distributing ownership appeared when practitioners outline a clear pathway to participation, uh, actively encouraging a power dynamic where stakeholders take the reins of the practice or <clears throat> when practitioners adopt an open uh, source ethos to their work, sharing knowledge and encouraging appropriation and repurposing of that practice. So for the Gray Area Foundation, which is an organization in the Bay that um, supports civic arts projects, the practice of distributing ownership appeared in their requirement of all civic artists to connect with neighborhood stakeholders to ensure that there are strong relationships between the artists and the neighborhood that result in the neighborhood eventually taking care of the project after the artist has completed it. And so the work, uh, the work required uh, artists to attend neighborhood meetings and build consensus around the objectives of the work so that uh, there was a clear value proposition for everyone involved. And I think the focus um, on distributing ownership as a core feature of civic design is really captured in this quote by Harry Backlund of City Bureau, who says, quote, are we going to define our success by the impact that we have directly with the public, or are we going to define it by the changes in the sector that result from the models that we develop? And so finally, we have persistent input. <clears throat> so Practitioners understand the context of their issues by not simply asking people what they think, uh, but doing so from a position of stability, continuity, and trust. So asking once and then being in the same place to ask again, this persistence is reflected in long-term relationships between practitioners and the communities they work in. And so the practice of understanding the problem through persistent relationships is not only what motivates the design of a particular story or project, it's really the value that that's driving the entire practice. So coming back to Jamie Calvin, he notes that while he didn't know how to solve the broader issue of, of police abuse that he was seeing, he knew that there was a problem and he wanted to quote, recruit reality uh, as a way to highlight a problem, even if he didn't know how, what to do to fix it. And so uh, reading from this quote uh, from Jamie in one of our interviews, he said, I'm not a policy guy. I don't know what to do with public housing. I'm standing here, uh, but I'm standing here, <clears throat> standing here. I was standing here yesterday. I'll be standing here tomorrow. I know this about these conditions. So it was kind of recruiting reality to our ends. And so now that I've gone over some of the, the kind of micro level practice of, of civic designers, I want to zoom out a bit away from these descriptions of practices and return to the context of civic design. And aside from the fact that this design work is happening with public serving institutions, um, what about the context of civic design is really unique? And one way to understand this uh, is in what Eric and I have described as the shift 
from human-centered design to public-centered design. So, you know, much of what we describe in the practice of civic design is not too far off from, say, the work of human-centered design methodologies, participatory design, design thinking. But what is different is this focus and objective of civic design that in some ways is more kind of predetermined and narrow in its commitment. So for example, with civic design, the focus is on publics, not individual needs. So we argue in the book that while all the issues in civic design contexts are indeed at their core human-centered, uh, in practice, they take on new texture uh, where the boundaries of the problem space are far more ambiguous, multiple and competing. Uh, the design strategies are driven by play, where rules and intentions are made clear, and the goal is to create relationships rather than focus uniquely on a solution. So I think that's really important to understand. Um, and the objectives, by creating moments of connection, are to set people up with the opportunities to come together and care for the issues that matter to them as a public. So I'm going to go into each of these in a little more detail now. Um, so uh, what is meant by publics? So a public, according to John Dewey, is the means by which individuals speak for the group. Um, how does this happen? How do people come to accept themselves as part of a public? And how are designers changing what uh, they do to accommodate multiple and overlapping publics? So whether this is Me Too, Black Lives Matter, or senior residents in an urban neighborhood, understanding uh, where identity converges across publics is the work that civic designers are actually doing. So reading this quote from the book, the civic designer by virtue of working with publics must have an understanding of how and why publics form. Publics operate in and for themselves, but they are often pushing up against other publics from which they have been excluded. To design in the civic space requires not only an understanding of the nature of the problem space, but also understanding, but also an understanding of who defined the problem and for what purpose and to whose end. So what is meant by play? Play is for its own sake, it's structured, and it's open to modification. And so looking to, um, uh, you know, looking at the words of Bernard, the work of Bernard Suits again, uh, reading a quote from the book here, as a design strategy, meaningful inefficiencies structure play, but equally as important, they structure the ability for players and spectators to reflect on the rules and limits of a game. Uh, by defining the field and its constituent rules, one inevitably defines the conditions that create the experience of playing with it and the possibilities of playing with it. And so, again, what we mean by play here is by it's the idea of making the rules of engagement very explicit, right? Kind of removing the mystery of process so that people understand how they're going to participate, what kind of agency they have, and how they can start to affect some kind of change. And so when we think of civic designers, we think of civic designers accommodating players that step in and out of systems in such a way that accept and enable critique. And so we really, in the book, we really see Kaepernick as, as someone who stepped outside of the game of football in order to critique the world outside of the game. And so when we think about meaningful inefficiencies and this idea of play, we think about how meaningful inefficiencies accommodate those who remove themselves from a game to draw attention to the inequities of that game and the world it exists, that exists within it. So you can see this in the work of Jamie Calvin, who is there to really help people step outside of the world of kind of oppression and, and the, the abuse of power and to see what's happening as, a, as an opportunity to critique it. A good example of this is a project that we worked on um, when I was at the Engagement Lab with Eric. Uh, it was called Participatory Pokemon Go. And uh, as designers, we wanted to use this game as a means of enabling people to step outside of it and critique the world that the game sits in. Um, and the opportunity to do this came about when um, Niantic uh, wanted to collaborate with the Engagement Lab on a contest to work with Boston Public School students to uh, submit uh, recommendations for new locations for the game. Um, so if you're you know, familiar, familiar or not familiar with the game, right, it's a, it's a location-based AR game where 
you, know, you go out into the world with your smartphone and you uh, walk to different locations and then that brings up different interactions um, uh, in the app. Now, some of the neighborhoods in Boston that had the least uh, amount of, of game locations happened to be underserved communities. And when we approached community-based organizations about the opportunity to participate in recommending new locations, we, we quickly realized that you know, we weren't digging deep enough. We weren't really creating the kind of opportunity for critique uh, that the community-based organizations were looking for. Um, and so through extensive conversations, we learned that what was more enticing for the community-based organizations was to participate in shaping the description of new and existing uh, stops, um, locations, to better reflect the rich history of rapidly gentrifying neighborhoods. So what resulted was a series of workshops that we conducted with community-based organizations, youth media organizations um, that were really focused on, on history and local storytelling. And we brought everybody together uh, to act as the stewards of local history by essentially taking control of this private database that was owned by Niantic to claim a space for the historical narrative that mattered to them. And so this happened, like we did these workshops, we had these young people writing, um, doing research and writing about locations, working with local historians to write descriptions of, of locations uh, that really matter to them uh, that are now permanently part of the game. And so to give you an idea, um, uh, you know, on the left, on the left side, we have uh, what was the original description of a, a really famous mural in um, the Roxbury neighborhood of Boston. Um, and then on the right, you see uh, how the uh, description evolved, right? And this is all through uh, young people conducting research with local historians to write these new descriptions. And so uh, in this case, the mechanism of play was this act of, of surfacing and making accessible the terms of engagement within Niantic systems. And so finally, what is meant by care? Uh, so simply put, you know, we situated our definition of care in Joanne Toronto's work on the ethics of care, where she describes democracy as the distribution of caring responsibilities. So that to participate in a democracy is to care with your fellow citizens about shared issues. And so coming back to uh, Pokemon, the Pokemon example, the output of care can be described as this creation of an opportunity for people to care with each other and act on the needs to preserve local history in a popular private domain uh, that's typically not concerned with this question of preserving history in rapidly gentrifying neighborhoods. So in summary, the framework of civic, civic innovation is that it is public centered, it cultivates play, all for the purpose of care, which is essential to rebuilding trust between public serving organizations and uh, the people in those communities. And so since the publication of the findings from our research around the practice of civic design, um, my work with Eric has been used by public serving organizations to frame their approach to building trust with their core constituents. For example, uh, the civic design practice uh, the civic design practice has been translated into an app called Meter, which allows public serving organizations to track the progress with building relationships and trust. So a lot of the constructs, um, uh, the, the, the framework was then translated into some constructs uh, that were uh, developed into an algorithm that can now be used to help people measure uh, their progress. Um, and that's it. That's there we have it. That's meaningful inefficiencies and um, some of the ways that it can be used to uh, think through some of the challenges that we're facing uh, today. So thank you, uh, Dustin, again, for the opportunity to share this with all of you today. Yeah, yeah, great. Uh, thanks, thanks so much uh, for presenting. Um, yeah, so can you tell us a bit more about that application at the end that you mentioned? It seems a bit funny to me. Um, you know, having a critique about sort of a digital expediency um, and, and then to develop a, a system, a, a framework to, you know, but yes. it, um, so, so what, uh, Iron is not lost. <laughs> yeah. Who, so who is, who's been using, using that system and for what purposes? 
Yeah, so there's a, uh, the University of Oregon uh, collaborated with the Engagement Lab. Um, and hopefully I'm not leaving, leaving out another collaborator there, but um, it's uh, research on uh, engagement journalism, which is a, a form of journalism that really puts front and center the relationship with the community members and really brings community members to into the process of writing articles, right? So it pushes back against this uh, model where, you know, journalists might just show up in a community, get their scoop, disappear, and not really engage in longer term uh, relationships with the rest of the community. So what the app is intended to do, and it's been used by this, uh, this project with the University of Oregon and um, Emerson College with a network of engagement journalists around the world. It's a, it's a way for them to reflect on the progress of their work. So there's a set of questions that they're asked um, at, a, at a regular cadence that asks them questions like, you know, how, how would you measure the level of trust with the people that you're working with? How many times have you been meeting with them? Uh, there's just a whole uh, kind of long survey there that is designed to help uh, people reflect on the work that they're doing and make sure that they're really oriented towards this trust building as a kind of central component of, of their practice. So it's been used primarily by engagement journalists. And um, I also know that Eric has been doing this work um, in, I'm going to say Transylvania, <laughs> uh, with uh, government there uh, as they're exploring um, new modes of civic engagement. And they're, they're very much interested in using um, this framework as a way to measure their progress. Have, has, has this work informed the way you approach your, your work um, at, at IDEO, like when you're collaborating with colleagues there? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously the, the, the pace of work um, in the private sector uh, is, is <laughs> it makes it challenging to engage in these longer term relationships that I think are, are really essential to civic design. That said, you know, I'm, I'm always looking for ways to uh, sneak in different moments of, of kind of critical reflection and, and community engagement in the process. And so I think that, you know, one thing that um, I've really been making progress on and, and will be using in an upcoming project is the role of, is the practice of holding space, right? Where, you know, typically, you know, we, you know, when, we, when we're done gathering data, we might share the data, we would share our findings with our client, right? Um, but we don't always share what we find back with the broader community or, or, you know, core stakeholders outside of the client to say pressure test some of the conclusions that we've reached. And so <clears throat> one of the things that we've been uh, really uh, developing a lot at IDEO now is um, the role of advisory panels, advisory councils where these are you know core stakeholders that are not part of the client group right but are people that have a uh, a real interest in the thing that you are creating and will be there throughout the course of the project they are paid participants um, they are recruited by IDEO and they are there to you know push on the conclusions that you reach right they are there to push on some of the early findings that you have right and so it's really this idea of first you're building that trusting relationship with the group really creating that sense of permission that they are there to uh, tell you what's up and that um, they're there at all moments to make sure that any conclusion that you reach um, is is not um, you know is really being checked for any kind of bias that you might be bringing to to the process. So uh, that is something that, you know, certainly in the private sector is, is unique to the extent that it definitely takes more time and more resources, but there's just really a growing acknowledgement that, um, you know, especially as, as firms like IDEO start to move into the space of systems design, um, you know, realizing that the, the network of stakeholders is far broader, that the, the boundaries of the problems are not as neat and tidy as they used to be when you were just focusing on a product. Um, having those moments where people can, can show up and really pressure test the assumptions at all moments throughout the project can really help to mitigate the kind of bias that might be um, uh, 
you know, that it might emerge um, if you didn't have that kind of pushback. And uh, th so the panel would be some variation of like talking about the um, the mechanisms of play or participation, the kind of structures that are put into place to facilitate people's kind of involvement. I mean, do you, do you go into yeah. more detail into like the, the dynamics around sort of the um, how to facilitate interaction and play like uh, what in the book? Yeah, absolutely. There, in the book, there are a number of cases that talk about what play looks like. I, one of my favorite examples from the book is around participatory budgeting. Uh, and uh, this wonderful project that Eric ran at the Engagement Lab, where it was a series of workshops that were designed to prepare people for the participatory budgeting process, right? So people were engaging in these workshops where they were um, not actually doing the participatory budgeting that they would eventually do, but we're starting to learn about what it would be and using um, kind of proxies for that process. And what was really fascinating about that is that um, there was, in, in the book we talk about this example, when there was a group of people that showed up to one of these preliminary workshops and they thought they were there to do the participatory budgeting and they showed up with their, their group their allies that they were going to um, use to kind of push their agenda through. And they got really upset that this wasn't actually one, the, the real thing, right? They were like, well, why, why is everybody here? Why are we doing this whole thing? And this is really wasting time. And one of the reflections that we really um, dig into in the book is that what people then realized is that what they were learning is that within the participatory budgeting process, one of the things to understand is that there are these power dynamics at play, right? And that through this meaningful inefficiency, through this seemingly kind of like inefficient moment of having a meeting before the meeting, right? People became much more aware of the power dynamics that play out in these public processes that then better prepared them to participate more fully. Um, when that that moment came. So yeah, I mean, we have a, a number of examples like that in the book that, that highlight the role that play um, uh, affords to uh, help people understand what those, those the rules of engagement are um, in, in public processes. And do you think, um, so I mean, in, in the, the sub sort of title of the book, right, you talk about digital expediency, but the, um, is there, it, it seems to me it's more just, uh, I don't know if it's necessarily digital so much as a kind of just the focus on the value or the idea that efficiency should be a top priority, right? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think, you know, when we started working on this book, um, a lot of the things that we were really responding to were the kind of was the excitement around smart cities, right, and civic tech, where there is this thinking that, you know, we can better understand publics, we can better understand the needs of the constituents by essentially installing surveillance, you know, really fancy surveillance mechanisms, right, to monitor the movement of people through the cities that understand, um, you know, what some of the pain points might be. Or maybe it's a question of, you know, using um, apps to help people improve the requests that they make to the city around public utility fixes that, that are needed, right? And so a lot of these things are, are done under the, the kind of mindset that, well, if we create a more efficient pipeline between people and government uh, and understanding them, then that's really, that, that will create a better, a better civic dynamic. Um, and unfortunately, you know, yes, maybe city government gets to learn a lot about people, uh, but they do it on their own terms, right? Like they're the ones that are creating the, the whole backend, the, the data system, right? They're the ones that are defining the, the data points that, that matter to them, right? And so it's really kind of a one-sided relationship in the end. And so the, the challenge of course though is, is yes, to your point, like efficiency is seen as, and certainly in the context of bureaucracy and, and the kind of public perceptions of bureaucracy being inefficient, right? Being slow to get things done. There's certainly this desire to create these systems that might seem like they're speeding things up and getting things done faster. Um, and I think that this is something that, you know, 
recently, uh, Roger Martin, who's a, a professor um, of, of management at the University of Toronto, uh, published a book about what, how efficiency is kind of this overrated um, value for for um, the economy, right? That we shouldn't be thinking about efficiency as as the the kind of uh, objective for the things that we create. So, yes, I, I think you're right. Like efficiency as as the objective is really being critiqued right now um, because what we're seeing is that people are actually really create the pendulum is swinging back to to people really craving relationships right creating in-person conversations there there's this craving to be understood um and you know it, it's challenging of course when we try to design things for scale right and i think that's something to consider when we when we explore to the design is this question of scale and scalability and 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 this kind of persistent desire to uh when we create something create it in such a way that will work for as many people as possible and and of course that's very much a market driven kind of high profit driven mentality right and i think in a civic context that just doesn't that doesn't work right like you, the needs are unique right from from one neighborhood to the next from one public to the next and and more importantly when we're dealing with publics those needs are not always very well defined. They're competing, right? Like one public, one, one social movement, you know, might publicly have a, a motto or a tagline, but internally you're gonna find that there's a lot of, of, of tension, right? Around what those needs are. And so uh, when you're designing for those spaces, uh, efficiency is, is not going to be the solution because um, people are really going to, to not agree on what the, the core need is, right? And so I think, you know, what when we, what, what I like to say is that with, with meaningful inefficiencies uh, in, in design, what we're really designing for is the conversation. We're designing for the moment for people to come together and to determine what the solution is going to be, right? Uh, designers are often kind of put in this position to come up with a solution to a problem. Uh, but I think with civic design, your goal is to come up with a way for people to come together to have conversations so that they can negotiate and and navigate uh, what the core priorities are going to be and then to take the take on those challenges um, and, I, and i certainly see that with the work of, of jamie calvin right like he i don't think we can look at the database as the solution right to to what led to um, these changes in, in the city of Chicago. Rather, it's the fact that that database is what brought people together. It's the database that helped to build those alliances. The database was the object of conversation that, that created the moment for people to, to come together, right? So it wasn't the database itself that, that solved these problems. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Um, uh, the sort of trying to locate the solution uh, with, you know, by working with the public, with publics together, right? I guess one of the things that was coming to mind was thinking about like, how do you, dis how do you discern um, sort of effective solutions or success? You know, what are like the outcomes that are looked for with when you're talking about these kind of meaningful inefficiencies? Because you're, you know, it's clearly like your concept you're, you're talking about design in terms of process, right? And, um, you know, but they're, you know, so how, do, how, it's just, and it's like, okay, it, it feels good, you know, it's good to have sort of a space where different stakeholders can come together, but in some cases there's just going to be conflict that can't be resolved, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, to what degree, like how, I mean, you can't solve all problems, um, right. And you know, like, what does uh, what what does uh, like a successful project look like? You know, um, or how do you di di discern that? You know, so. I, I don't yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's like some of what we, if you look at the the civic design practices that we outline, I think those are those are some of those um, elements that we kind of point to and say that like those are the things that you want to be aiming for. Right. So like imagine there's a project that like never actually achieves anything, but what it does achieve is that it builds a really strong network of, of activists. Right. It builds a it, build, it creates that moment and that opportunity for people to come together and have those conversations and recognize each other. You know, maybe they don't necessarily agree on 
on what to, to do and how to approach that challenge, but the fact that that network has been created, that those, those relationships, relationships have been created, um, that's, that's the success, right? Um, and that's, I think, in part what, what civic design, uh, one of the things that civic designers are aiming to do. Um, super fascinating. Uh, I, I just want to say if, if folks, ha if other folks have questions now is probably the time to, to chime in. Um, you can, you can just unmute yourself and ask a question or you can chat, you can type it up in the, in the, the chat bar here as well. Um, otherwise we will probably wrap up here pretty soon, but this was, this was really great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you again for, for the invitation to be part of this great series. Um, and yeah, it's been fun. I don't know very much about this topic. I just jumped in because I thought it might be <laughs> beneficial for me. I was wondering though, if there were any way, um, I'm probably gonna end up, I'm a designer, I'm probably gonna end up working for a market uh, making products and stuff. And I'd like there to be play and care and part of those values in it. Is there any way like you could see uh, market innovations kind of embodying civic innovations and maybe having their values and goals change? Yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's um, depending on the, the kind of firm that, that you work for, um, there, there has to be, I think that the first thing that there's Two, two parts, right? There, the first one is the kind of preliminary work that goes into the business development process where, um, you know, the portfolio directors, the partners, whatever, like when they are engaging in the work of building that relationship that they're really thinking about that long-term um, relationship, that long-term connection. Um, and in, in kind of the way that Jamie Calvin talks about it, right? That they're there for the long term. They're there for that persistent relationship to really understand things over time. So I think that's like a very important part, right? And that there's a, um, a commitment on the part of the company to communicating um, what has been learned over time to the designers on the ground that, that end up working on the project. Um, the second part I think is also when the work is happening, the um, the mechanisms that are used to um, elicit, to, to draw out data, to draw out learnings, um, can indeed be be very playful. Like I've seen some really wonderful projects around um, redesigning the um, financial aid application process at, at community colleges, where um, the goal of, of the project was actually to build empathy between the students and the administrators. And what um, some of my colleagues did was um, they created this giant uh, board game. It was kind of like the, based on the game Shoots and Ladders. And the idea was to have the administrators walk through it and um, experience the moments that a lot of the students were experiencing, those, those pitfalls, those obstacles, right, that make the whole financial aid application process uh, miserable for so many students. And, you know, if you were to look at something like that, uh, you know, from, from the standpoint of like, well, we're, we're trying to improve this process, like, why are you building a giant immersive game? Like, what are we going to take from this? Um, you know, you might, people might not see the, the value initially, but, um, the goal there was to just actually strengthen the relationships between the administrators and the students and help to create some empathy. And that was an essential part of, uh, of um, the success of that project. And so I think it's just, um, you know, it really comes down to kind of the creativity and the, and the potential buy-in to, to those new methods uh, on the part of the company. So if the culture is right, you know, if the culture is into that, um, I think that you can really uh, go far with with these with these mechanisms of play. That's that's amazing. Um, could you share what the anything about so I could find that project or, or any sort of? Like, I, I don't know if that's if that's um, that's a, a published case study or not. But uh, I see. But it's part of the engagement lab. Like that's the kind of thinking behind that. Oh, the probably the project I just shared with you was was uh, an IDEO project just now. Yeah, but I, but certainly the the. Um, the uh, participatory budgeting project that I 
talked about earlier. Uh, that's an engagement lab project. That's something that you can find on the website and you can also find it, uh, the description of it in the book as well. Um, I'm sorry, but what is IDO? What is the website? Sorry. <laughs> uh, IDO.com. Okay. IDEO.com. Thank you so much. All right. Well, if anyone else has a question, uh, go ahead and ask it. Otherwise, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up here. We have probably time for one more question. But. I'll just share um, this screen. If anybody wants to, that's my email. That's my Twitter handle. Send me an email. Send me a message if you have any questions. Great, thank you so much. All Thanks, right. Dustin. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks. Bye.